I mean, I think comedy is a part of civil discourse. I don't think comedy has a specific role in civil discourse. I think sometimes people think the comedy they like is more important than other comedy. So they think, therefore, the comedy they like has some sort of role or is doing something. But really, comedy is just doing whatever it's doing. So you can like Lewis Black and think he's saying important things, and he's saying important things to you. But that does not mean that he is important in civil discourse. You know what I'm saying? So like, I feel like a lot of times we, people think the comedy that they like is the only comedy that's good, True. and the comedy they don't like is not even comedy. Mm -hmm. It's like it's not even, it's not even, it's not, like you, people can be sitting, and this happens in comedy all the time, you can be doing comedy in a room full of people and everybody's laughing except for one person, and you cannot convince that one person that you're good. <laughs> no amount of people laughing. If they think you're not good, you're not good. So I've learned, so over, I think when I started doing comedy, I did have a sense of like, I'm doing, I'm basically like if Jesus was funny, you know, whatever. But, uh, <laughs> and I know Jesus was funny, calm down, Jesuits. But, uh, <laughs> but I think at some point, this is what I learned from what, I used to watch John Stewart on The Daily Show and he'd be like, I'm not, a, I'm just a comedian, I'm not a journalist, I'm not the news. And I'd be like, come on, man, you know. But then I haven't been as, I'd be like, oh yeah. We have to claim that space as comedy as being separate, as being its own particular job. Because the minute it becomes subsumed into other jobs, people have expectations that are outside of like, no, I'm really just trying to be funny. So does that answer some of the question? Yeah, no, that was more of trying to figure out the role or if it did have a role. And I've I mean, every, comedy has a role in that people often can take comedy to sort of like, I say this happens with Chris Rock all the time, especially back in the day. His, his jokes about things became people's way to explain their opinion about things. Mm. So, like Chris Rock had a joke, he said, there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy. Shaquille O'Neal is rich. The white man who signed Shaquille O'Neal's checks is wealthy. And everybody who heard that was like, let me explain to you the difference between rich and wealthy. <laughs> like it became a way for people to sort of like, sometimes they would quote Chris, sometimes they wouldn't. But it became a way for people to sort of go, now I can explain this thing that I couldn't figure out a way. Comedy is a way to cut through and sort of like, the, if you laugh, you go, oh, I understand. Now, some people think if you laugh, that means you agree. It doesn't mean you agree. It just means you understand the point. Oh, thank you. All right, well, thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as this year has gone on, we've tried to come up with ways that students can engage with others on campus. And you've shown us that there's a lot of mediums through comedy, but what advice would you give to students who can't connect to people through comedy? And what steps can we take to engage with others in civil discourse? You have to create active locations where that happens, and then you have to work to make them better if they're not working. So you have to, like, you can't just expect, I mean, I said this to somebody else, that like, United Shades is an active way to create conversations with people because we like, we say we're coming to town. Do you want to talk to us? Do you want to be on film? Can you be there tomorrow morning? Can you make sure you're wearing clothes? Whatever, you know, so like people show up ready to have that conversation. But you can't, so therefore I can sit across from like Winty Singh who's a, who has a whole blog about 11 things to, uh, but that you want to know about my turban, we're, we're afraid to ask. And so he has a whole blog about that. So I can sit across from him at this prescribed time for the prescribed purpose and ask him quote unquote dumb questions about his turban and he's like ready to answer them. What you shouldn't do is see a sick walking down the street and go, hey, tell me about your turban. <laughs> so I think sometimes people get confused about how to create those conversations. Mm -hmm. 
when really it's like we have to work to, ha to have those conversations. So if you're somebody on campus who wants to know about the sick culture, then you say, then you sort of, you, maybe you find out who on campus is, is a representative of that culture, who off campus is a representative of that culture. How can I, how can I rent a room like this, a reserve room like this, and say I'm inviting six to come to, to talk about their culture, and we're gonna have, and then how can we create a format through which it encourages conversation? Because a lot of times people will reserve the room, they'll set up the thing, but they don't know how to actually stimulate the conversation. So you can get, and I've been in many rooms like that, where everybody's in the room like, we're here to talk about uncomfortable things. <laughs> and then you sit for an hour, and then it's like, okay, you know, like, you have to figure out to be constantly working. And I only know how to do this, because I only know, however well good I am at it or not good at it, because I've been doing it for a while. So it's not, you have to be willing to fail your way into success, into efficiency. So if you do, I think a lot of times people go, like, for example, I'm always like, white people, you need to talk to your, to your people. Like, you know, people are like, like about the whole like political situation. You need to talk to the people in your life who, who voted for Trump. I don't know anybody. Everybody goes home for Thanksgiving. You need to talk to that uncle. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and people go, well, I tried one time. Why did you think it was going to help in one, for one conversation? I think that's the same thing on college campuses. Why did you think one conversation was going to be the thing that changed the world, you know? So I think people have to, you have to be aware to do it. We tried it once, didn't work. We tried it again. We're going to try it in the morning. We're going to get donuts next time. We're going to not get donuts, whatever. You have to keep working on the way in which you're having the conversation until you figure out a way to, that it feels productive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. What do you think does help people kind of step out of their comfort zone and not just sit there awkwardly when they're in the midst of a comfortable conversation? Like, how do you set, how do you create that space for people? Well, that's why it helps to be a comedian, because comedians are, <laughs> our job is to go into situations that are, uh, where it's 50, 100 strangers, or 2,000 strangers, or in Kevin Hart's example, 120,000 strangers, mm -hmm. and get them into a unified group who's all paying attention. So for me, it's like, I, talk about, I talked about this did a class with uh, Christina Zamfania, and it was like I was sort of explaining in the class why, as a comedian, I kind of know how to go in these situations and sort of like figure out how to talk to people and sort of like at least how to loosen them up. You have to, when you're having these conversations, if you're the one who brought people there for the conversation, then you have to host the conversation. You're not just there to have it. You have to sort of create the environment. So some of that means like figuring out ways to get in that's not like we're talking about the thing we're here to talk about. You know, you have to figure out ways to sort of like, you know, like what you know, when you seed the clouds for rain, you have to seed the room for conversation. And you have to figure out whether it's like, we're gonna show a bunch of different blog entries that people, or we're going to watch a clip, or we're going to, everybody walk around and, and introduce yourself and say something that makes you happy or say, whatever. You have to figure out ways, you can't just expect that everybody's gonna walk in a room and just sort of start to have uncomfortable conversations. And therefore that means you have to bring people into that room who can have the, who can sort of like help push the conversation along and who are good at it. Everybody knows good talkers, everybody knows people who aren't afraid to talk in a group. Those people can come in and help sort of move things along. And if nobody's moving it along, then you have to figure out, well, how do we, what's, ha what's not happening here? How do we, how do we, it, how do we, you have to be setting goals for what are you trying to accomplish every session so it's not just about like, well, we got, we taught, we tried. You know what I mean? It's not enough to try. <laughs> you have to actually walk out feeling like, whoo, like for me, it's about like pushing things to a place, and I don't mean pushing in an aggressive way, but just getting things to a place where you feel like people are like, oh, I didn't, like people are surprised about themselves, or I didn't know this was gonna happen, or, or like oh, when I'm on stage, I will regularly walk off stage and go through the crowd, because people go, oh, oh, because it just gets people paying attention. Or I will, I will talk directly to people, and people go, he's talking directly to me, and other people go, he's talking to that person. Like it just gets people knowing we're all in the same room, this is all happening in real time, you're not watching this on TV over there. So for me, it's like, you really have to be interested in and, and proficient in and get better in, and I didn't start out, I'm, I was not a good public speaker as a kid, so this is not something that I was born with, in how to, like, in, in comedy we call it working a crowd. Like how to work a crowd, how to work, and, it's, and the same thing, comedy, being a con man, being a salesman, it's all the same thing. It's all like looking at people and sort of looking at what they are and doing and saying, and then going like, oh, I'm, I'm getting something off this person. Oh, I can sort of connect to that. Oh, oh they're, fine. they're relaxed. Hey. And so for me, with the comics, like now that I've relaxed, you give me your laugh. With the con man, give me your money. With the salesman, give me your money. You know, like so, but it's the same, it's the same thing. It's, you have to be actually paying attention individually to the people in the room as you talk to, you know, it, as I talk to the group. I'm looking around, I'm noticing things, I'm going, oh, you know, he says champion right here on his shirt. <laughs> you know, like, it's just because I just, like, but I'm paying attention, like, what does that mean? I don't know, but I know it says it there, you know what I mean? So it's like paying attention to the environment, you know? 
with our friends outside of those arenas or outside of class and it's almost like nobody wants to be the one to start it and nobody knows how seriously to take it. So I guess I definitely relate to what you're saying about creating kind of a space for those conversations to happen. I'm wondering if you think that that is just kind of by default the best way to handle it or if there's a way that sort of spontaneous civil discourse can happen too. And spontaneous civil discourse can happen. There's the clip that's going around now of the, that was is a great example of spontaneous civil discourse is the clip of the woman at Lake Merritt who called the cops on the black guy's barbecue and, and it turned into a whole t spontaneous civil discourse that you can watch the whole, ver and was, it's amazing that, it, that people clearly took it upon themselves to like, I'm going to be in this moment now and I'm going to work this moment. Like people weren't just they weren't just yelling at her, the woman. Um, you know, everybody in the story, uh, I don't know if she was white, but is a white-skinned woman, <laughs> like, so I don't want to, uh, who, there's a black man barbecuing at Lake Merritt in Oakland, and she said they were not supposed to be barbecuing, but they were okay to be barbecuing, and also, why do you give a shit? But, uh, <laughs> but so she called the non-emergency number to say there's black, there's people, didn't say black, I don't know, but there's people barbecuing where they shouldn't be barbecuing. Uh, you know they're black. Uh, so... <laughs> There, and so, she, and she got on the phone, and it was clear that the people who sort of like, there's a time where we, where people would have seen a woman calling the cops on black men, and they just, even black people would have walked past and go, well, I know what that is. But because we're all in the world right now aware that like, that there's this thing where black people are not allowed to be outdoors, people like, were like, I got to get in there. And then what they didn't do is get in there and go, they didn't like yell at her in a way, they didn't like beat her up, they didn't, they just sort of like turned it into a thing. Like, we're, why are you calling the cops? What are you hoping to accomplish? Why do you care? And so when you watch the video, it becomes a, very, it's, it becomes a great example of, of spontaneous civil discourse, which ends with her crying at a policeman's feet because she, feels, it's cause she felt like she had been harassed, which is like, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you call the cops for no reason. People said, don't do that, and you feel harassed. So to me, it's like, that's a great example of spontaneous civil discourse, but because it was needed. It's not, the, but, but again, that's, that's the thing where it's like people sort of rose to the occasion, but I think that generally you have to create a space for it, and you have to be, if you're gonna create that space, you have to be willing to lead it. Comedians are very good at leading a group of people or leading this thing because that's our job. But if you're gonna put yourself in that situation, then if nobody's talking or if everybody's all just to start, you have to be like, I'm gonna start it. And, if, and I'm gonna talk until other people start talking. I'm not gonna go, let's get started. You know, you have to be like, let's get started. And you have to sort of keep the, keep the ball up in the air until somebody else hits the ball. Yeah. I think when it comes to the sort of challenges to civil discourse, there are logistically these challenges, um, sort of tactical issues of how do you foster civil discourse. But then there are also normative challenges. Um, you know, what conversations should we be having? In college, now he said normative. <laughs> you know, when I went out normative, that's how you know. <laughs> my wife, my wife is a PhD, so I've heard that word before. So, <laughs> luckily, I'm like, I got it, I got it. <laughs> um, so my question to you is: Are there viewpoints that you think shouldn't be engaged, topics that shouldn't be discussed, or facts that aren't up for debate? And if so, what are those views or facts or topics? I mean, people are arguing about, people are like deep involved in arguments about whether or not The Last Jedi is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Those things drive me crazy. <laughs> I stay out of them, but I'm like, are you really gonna go back and forth on whether or not The Last Jedi is authentic to the source material of nonsense? You can be upset about it. I'm not gonna engage in that civil discourse. But I'm saying that if people are gonna do that, then we can talk about the alt-right, we can talk about the Ku Klux Klan, we can talk about right-wing politics, we can talk about fundamental Christianity, we can talk about uh, the incel, is that, am I saying it right? Incels? Incels, yeah, yeah. That's, see, that's so new. Some people like, oh, we can talk about incels and what the, We can talk about all those things if we can talk about Star Wars. You know what I mean? So I feel like I, nothing is off, nothing is like, we should, I don't feel like there's anything we shouldn't engage in because we engage in nonsense all the time that people feel is important. I'm going to call it nonsense because I'm ju being judgmental, but I also understand, well, no, yes, Star Wars is an allegory for blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. 
it's basically someday they're going to look at that and go, there's the Bible, then there's Star Wars. Which one is the way to. <laughs> That's going to happen. So I, but I get it. But so I just feel like when people tell me I, I can't talk to Richard Spencer on TV, and I'm like, you're talking about stuff. We're talking about Star Wars. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like this is, he actually represents a, a significant political viewpoint. People follow that viewpoint, and that viewpoint feels like it's on the rise. Yeah. And I don't want it to rise. So for me, it's like, I, the, the thing I give Richard Spencer credit for when I talked to him in the United States is he was willing to have the conversation. I think when it's not productive is when people aren't willing to have the conversation. There's many people I won't talk to because it's like the only conversation we've ever, I knew after it was over was never going to make the show. It was a conversation we did in the episode about, uh, we did an episode about Muslims in small town America. And they decided to book a woman who was anti-Islam. I was like, do we need to do this? I don't actually think that's, you know, I don't need, I don't need, to, he I don't need to hear an anti-Islamic viewpoint. I think I got it. I, I flipped past Fox News. Uh, <laughs> but they were like, well, it'll help give it some balance. So, and so we talked to her, and she was, she was forget the fact she was anti-Islamic. She was just horrible. She was just not good at a conversation. She was not, she didn't want to go back and forth. She just wanted to, like, speechify. And so as soon as I just sort of, at some point I realized she wasn't going to let me talk. Every time I tried to talk, she said I was interrupting her. When she was just sort of not taking a breath, she was like, and so at the end of it, when she, I just was like, okay, I just got to wait for her to finish. I'm married. I know how to do this. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, I know how to shut up and just wait. Like, all right. There was with my wife. I don't leave the room afterwards. But I was just like, all right. I really just went to like, all right, like pretend like you didn't take out the trash cans, whatever. So. And I just sat there, and then she finished. I was like, are you done? I was like, yeah. She's like, are you done, done? Yeah, all right, thank you. And I got up and walked away. Like, it was just like, we're never going to put that on the air because there's no value to this, you know. So for me, it's only not valuable if the people are not actually there to have the conversation, which happens often on college campuses where it's like it's set up to be a conversation, but it's really just one side is like, I'm going to yell, yell, yell over you, and the other side is like, well, I guess I have to yell if they're going to yell, and then it becomes like, well, that's not actually civil discourse. That takes the civil part out of the discourse. And you brought up Richard Spencer, and I know on your show you interviewed members of the KKK. Mm -hmm. And it seems like from, from interviews I've seen, a lot of people have asked you whether or not you feel like you're giving those voices a platform and if that's problematic. And it, it seems like your response has kind of been, well, this is a reality of something that's happening in America. Like, we need to talk about it and depict it. Um, and so I'm just curious. And also, I don't think I was giving them a platform. That's the other thing. I mean, I just want to be clear. I, I don't believe I was giving that. Putting people on TV is not the same as giving them a platform. And I think that's, that's, how, that's, that's how I hit, didn't feel about it. Right, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about kind of the response from that side that their arguments are well founded in free speech. And I think in a reflection of your interview with Richard Spencer, you mentioned that. Um, like the alt-right is working hard to cloak its desire to create chaos in the streets as free speech. And Did I'm I write wondering, that? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just like, oh, good cloak. That's not a word I use a lot. Uh, I was Maybe feeling very, uh, like, yeah. Maybe my wife rewrote that. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, but I just, I think that's been, that's been a topic we've been tackling that is, less, it's not talked about commonly, free speech, what does it mean, what value does it bring to us. Um, so I'm curious how you'd respond to their argument that that's valid under free speech or... I mean, the, the, it's, the, what is it, I, uh, I disagree with you say, but I died to defend your right to say it, or whoever said that, his name was Oprah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, as a comedian, I'm a big proponent of free speech. And there's many comedians who I disagree with politically who I think are hilarious. I mean, it's just the nature of the game. There's people who say things where I'm like, oh, that's so, mm -mm. and I'm like, that's really funny. I like how you wrote that. It's just like, I'm an, as a grown up adult in the world, we have, I mean, we, we see it with music all the time. You can, and Chris Rock has a bit about this because he says about everything. Uh, basically, like, you can love a song and not actually support what the song is saying. People, you know, people, Chris Rock had a joke about women dancing in clubs, like, and the songs are filled with, like, all the misogynistic what, and they're like, you're not talking about me, you know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> we, we do it with music all the time. We do, we don't, you know, we don't, dis, we don't totally, but with comedy, there's a tendency to go, I don't, to certainly take this, take the thing more seriously, which is fine if you don't want to listen to it, but don't act like that makes, just because you don't want to do it, makes it like nobody should have it, you know? So I think that, again, it's about, like, I don't think it's funny, so it's not comedy, so... Uh, 
I've defended comedians who don't even like me, who think, who, you know, so I just, I, it's like, it's not, I just, we have to, I, I believe in the ability to have the free speech. What I don't believe is that you have freedom from consequences from that free speech. Free speech works not just both ways, it works all the ways. It's 360 degrees on all sides. So I feel like if you, you, if you can say, you say whatever you want to say, and then sometimes you got to deal with the consequences of saying it. And so, like, comedians have gotten, comedians who've had to apologize for everything they said, 90% of the time, it's because they had a job outside of being a stand-up comic. Like Gilbert Gottfried said something, he tweeted something about the, Jap the tsunami in Japan, and he got fired from his job as the Aflac duck. Uh, Tracy Morgan said, had a joke that was homophobic, and basically he was on 30 Rock at the time, and I'm sure Tina Fey called him like, you better clean this up. And so he apologized, he met with Glad, he's very, he still talks about it. When people apologize comics, it's because they're like, they, it's not that they can't get away with the free speech, but they actually are representing somebody else because they have a job. Cat Williams has never apologized because he does not work for anybody but Cat Williams. So for me, it's like I'm happy for comedians to have free speech. You just don't have he. Cat Williams has been able to deal with the consequences, whereas like a lot of comedians are like, I don't know if I can deal with these consequences. But I think there are comedians in general who's like, comedians should never have to apologize. And I think that's that's weak-minded to think you should never apologize. That's actually profoundly weak to think that you can't apologize. I'm intrigued by this, this idea that um, putting people on TV is different from giving them a platform. Mm -hmm. Could you sort of parse out the distinction there? What everything, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, everything has a frame around it. You don't turn on CNN and just see news. You see Don Lemon's show. You see Anderson Cooper's show. You, any, any, Fox News has a very different frame than, so, uh, than, uh, than CNN's frame, you know, when you watch Everything, nothing just comes like sort of stream of consciousness out into your world. And also, here's what I feel like if, a few years ago, A&E, so I do a thing where I meet with the Klan. People accuse me of giving the Klan a platform. Even though if you watch the whole show, it's clear whose side I'm on. <laughs> I'm not like, mm, some people say the Klan is bad, some people say they're good. I don't know what I think. <laughs> So I think a lot of times people are reacting to an image they see of the show, or they, or they watch a clip, which is how we watch a lot of things, and then they sort of judge the whole thing, which is, I accept, but it's also like, that's not, how it actually, that's not actually fair to the project, but fine. But I can live with it. I can accept those consequences. Uh, but so for me, it's like, I was like this, uh, the whole time, I'm black, I don't like the Klan, I'm married to a white woman. I told them I was married to a white woman. I didn't shot, you know, like I was myself. There's white people in the episode who I hug because I'm like, you're fighting the good, because they're the ones who are like fighting the fight against the Klan. It's very clear what I think about them and how they're being framed. You don't have to want to watch the show, though, if you just don't want to watch the show for any number of reasons. I don't want to watch the Klan, it's triggering. I, I don't think Kamau's funny. I don't, hate, I don't like CNN. That, fine, don't watch it, but let's not come up with like some sort of like, it's a platform. I feel like that's, that's intellectualizing your I don't want to watch it is what I feel like. It's, like I don't, it's putting an intellectual argument on what you don't want to see just because you want to sound like you make an intellectual argument. Uh, A&E said, after I did my show about a year later, A&E came up with a show that they said was, that was going to be called Generation KKK, which was a reality show about a family of Ku Klux Klan members. And people went, <laughs> And A&E had to cancel the show. First thing they did, first day, so it's Generation KKK about a family of clan members, a rea like a classic Dog the Bounty Hunter reality show where it's like, oh, the, the old dad is racist but funny. The, you know, the young, the, his son is racist but not so funny, you know, whatever. It's like Duck Dynasty. It was gonna be like Duck Dynasty for the clan, <laughs> which was already kind of. Uh, so people were like, a reality show for the clan? That, to me, because we know what a reality show is, and we have an idea that reality shows create stars, and reality shows sort of create comedy out of like, basically, basically take, take, like they take celebrities and make them look human, that's what the thing is, or they take humans and turn them into celebrities. We sort of know how that thing works. People were like afraid, like that is normalizing the clan. Because that feels like you're just gonna put them on TV as sort of comic figures who, I hate black people, but also I get confused at Costco, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, I can't find the crosses to burn. Uh, and so Andy got all this pushback and then they hired like Color of Change, I think it was, to like they were gonna do interstitials during the commercial breaks to go, also the Klan is wrong. Somebody was gonna do it. And then eventually they just pulled the show because they were like, we can't, and they already filmed, they'd already filmed it. They just pulled it and said, we can't release it. And, and I stayed silent during the whole thing, but all these articles were written like how what I had done on United Shades was different than this. And I was like, that's, to me, 
normalizing is a very specific thing. It's when you're sort of letting the thing speak for itself and you're not putting a frame around it to, quanti to quantify what, what this means. So for me, it's like a six minute conversation with Richard Spencer in a 42 minute show that is clearly about the, why immigration and refuge, why America sort of encouraging immigration and protecting refugees and encouraging refugees. And there's a six minute interview about a guy who doesn't want to do that, but the entire show is about why it's important for America to continue to do that. Just to me, it's like that's, that's, that's the definition. That's, I'm not normalizing him. I'm normalizing immigration and refugees. And the fact is, is that Richard Spencer's viewpoint may not have been important at some point, but that was, but Trump's in office. Steve Bannon's in the cab, like in that White House. To me, it was like, it's very clear, like, I can't get an interview with Steve Bannon or Trump. <laughs> so like, and this guy is the leader of the movement. So yes, I just feel like, I think after the election, a lot of people got afraid. And so then instead of like, it became easier to, I can attack Kamau, because I don't know how to deal with this. I can attack this person who's on my side, but I don't like what they're doing, because I don't know how to deal with all this. And so I felt like I was just sort of like, I was, after I fought the argument, I argued a few times, then I just stepped back and go, I, I think I'm going to be, history, not history, but I think I'm going to be proven that whatever, that I'm on the right side of this at some point. A year later, Richard Spencer's on, on YouTube begging people to pay his legal fees. Yay! <laughs> like, you know, so I just feel like it didn't take that long for me to be proven. It's like, yeah, don't, he's, I, think, I think I'm a part of a movement that is exposing him. Just if I could sure. play devil's advocate a little bit, and I promise I'll shut up I just, since we're on, we're on the point. Um, don't be devil's advocate. Just say, I have some pushback. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't need the devil involved. <laughs> um, so, for example, in, in the case of the Richard Spencer interview, right? A six-minute segment and a 42-minute piece. Mm -hmm. um, I think the argument that some would make is that when you have a sort of portion of the show that sort of considers the counter-argument, mm -hmm. right, the tendency with TV shows is to take the most extreme form of the counter-argument, right? Mm -hmm. Richard Spencer and the alt-right or the Klan. Um, and the danger there is that it shifts the public's sort of range of what's considered normal sort of drags the spectrum a little bit. Um, so now, when we say, OK, the alternative view is Richard Spencer, then everything else relative to that seems more normal, uh -huh. even if it's actually extremely radical. So things that two years ago would have seemed unthinkable now seem conceivable because, hey, it's not Richard Spencer. Uh -huh. um, so what would you say to people who make that argument, that the danger in, in using Richard Spencer and the Klan as the counterbalancer is that it drags the spectrum and shifts our normal? I mean, I think that, like, it was a lot of things. One, I think if I was making one 42 minutes of television, one, one 42 minutes, and it was the only 42 minutes of television I was ever going to make, Richard Spencer's not going to make the cut. But if I'm making seasons of a television show, there's this thing where you're sort of like trying to like find different conversations, different arguments. And in that way, I think the thing about Richard Spencer specifically is like Trump had just won. It's not like I, like the Klan, we can talk about that separate. I feel like that's a separate thing. The Klan is a separate, but Trump, this dude, is, the, is like his, his through line of thought is, goes directly to the White House. And I think a lot of people hadn't really ever conceived of that, of what that, actually hadn't sat down and said, what are these people thinking? I think a lot of times the most woke of us think that everybody's as woke as us. And I'm on CNN. I'm not on Democracy Now. I'm not, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's a difference. I'm not on uh, RT Tonight, whatever. I'm on, I'm not, you know, this is a very specific audience. And, and I get tweets. This is what happens when an episode comes out. Like, for example, that one. There's a stream of, like the Klan episode, to go to that one. There's a stream of people like, why would you do this? We already know this. Why would you put them on TV? And there's a stream of people like, oh, my God, I had no idea. And I'm dealing with, and nobody knows that the other side is out there. Nobody's aware. They, everybody thinks their reaction is the reaction. This is, so for me, I'm like, if I, if, if, if I only got the pushback that was like, you have, ruined, you, you have ruined America by putting the Klan on TV, I'd be like, maybe I did a bad thing. But because I'm getting both, and also I'm getting, and like that Klan episode, whatever people think it is, it's the number one thing I hear about when I'm in the streets. Like if somebody stops me and goes, they want to talk about the show, and it's because people are like, hadn't, or just were like, I'd never seen anything like that before. And I think that it, for me, it's like, I'm, if, I'm do, if every episode of United Shades is me like, let's go back to the Klan, it's like, come on, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> but for me, it's like, I feel like this is all part of the cultural conversation. And I also think, the other thing is, I don't think Richard Spencer is the most extreme side of things. I don't think the Klan is the most extreme side of things. 
Like I think so that, it, and also, and this is the, other, the last thing I'll say before I, uh, before we continue, is that, it, so Richard Spencer's in that episode, and I, always, and I feel like this, there's so many other stories in that episode that people never bring up. In that episode, there's a woman named Ruby Corrado who has a home for, way, for refugees and undocumented people who make it across the border to DC. And it's like, a, it's, like a home, it's like a home for misfit toys, basically. And because Ruby is a trans woman, it also ends up being a home for a lot of runaway and, and refugee trans people. Ruby Corrado is in the same exact episode as Richard Spencer. If you want to talk about extremes, why don't we have the Ruby conversation? And so I feel, for me, it's like, what are we, I mean, I put them in the same episode. I was way more proud of the Ruby interview than I was of the Richard Spencer. It was a better interview. It was more fun. You can see that I'm having a good time. She's joking. The Richard Spencer interview is just weird. <laughs> but people are, this is, we, what you choose to focus on is what you choose to focus on. So for me, it's like, we could be, I could be having, I would love it if over the last year I'd been talking talks about Ruby Corrado, you know? It's in the same episode. So, you know, it's, again, it was not, Tonight on the United States of America, Richard Spencer for 42 minutes. I'm going to take the week off. <laughs> to me, that's different than like, we're going to talk to him. We're also going to talk to Ruby Corrado. We're also going to talk to this, this, this incubator for African, African refugees who are in America. You know what I mean? There's like, I, I would, it's interesting to me that, that, we, that we keep going. And I keep going, that we keep going back to Richard Spencer. Okay, so in terms of civil discourse, like the KKK episode, there's a point See, where... See, she just brought the KKK. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a point where they tell you that interracial marriage is an abomination, and you're like, okay, so on the scale of murder, like, where would... And they're like, it's up here. Yeah, I was like, is it worse than murder? I, I wish I'd done yeah. it better, but I was like, is it worse than murder? I said better than murder, which I don't think makes sense, but I meant, like, <laughs> is, is murder worse than interracial marriage? And he said interracial marriage is worse than murder. And I was like, are you... Like, I was like, wait, say it again, because I was... Yes. Yeah, yes. and so I feel like when, you ha when you're trying to engage in civil discourse, like, on this campus, a lot of people will feel attacked. And I, I know when I saw that part, I was, like, getting angry. Mm -hmm. So... To what degree do you think that taking yourself too seriously is an impediment to civil discourse? Oh, yeah, it's the number one problem. Like, if you look at the great orators of all time, in my <laughs> mind, especially the civil rights movement, they all had a sense of humor. Like, nobody was funnier than Malcolm X. Like, I feel like you have to be able to have a sense of humor about it, because if you get, because a sense of humor is how you alleviate the tension outside of you and the tension inside of you. And then you also get, you can sort of, in the middle of that moment, you can sort of like, wait, okay, let's, you can sort of step it down a notch before you keep talking, you know what I'm saying? So for me, even right now, I'm sort of every now and again, like, say it, make a joke. Because it just sort of like makes, because if we just, if it's just a serious conversation and we're just talking seriously, first of all, some people are going to start to fall asleep. And also, it just makes it seem like it's, it's, it's too much to put on a conversation, you know? So for me, it's like, humor is the way to sort of remind yourself that this is, we're just talking. These, right, these are just words. And it doesn't mean that people think humor, this is the other thing, people think humor is somehow a lesser of the communication art forms. <laughs> like, so like, why would you bring humor into this? When really, <laughs> you know, it, people, yeah, why, this is not a joking matter. Like, that's a thing people say. Humor is actually the highest level of human, like, sort of the ability to turn a phrase, the ability to, like, create illusions and, and wordplay is, like, the highest form of your intellect. And the fact that you can, in the middle of a situation, make a joke that actually applies to the situation and keeps the conversation moving, it's like, I feel like that. But people associate humor as one of the lowest forms of communications, which is like really a whole other a whole other discussion. Even though everybody who has ever taught to be a public speaker is told to open with a joke, because you want people, because that's the, the only way you know people are paying attention is if they're laughing at you. People can do like this and be thinking about their laundry. People can be crying and thinking about something that's far off. People can clap and just clap because everybody else is clapping. But if people are laughing, it means they actually like are paying attention to you. They're actually engaged in the point you're making. So for me, it's like, I don't know why you would, I don't know why, it's like if you have two arms, why would you tie one behind your back if you need to help your friend move? Like, you know, you know like, I mean, if you have two arms, let's use both arms. Like, it's just another technique in which to move the conversation along. And I think that's when people, so two things to sort of, talk. when people talk about the Richard Spencer thing or the Klan, they go, you guys were laughing. You were laughing. Which to me is like, why do you hate laughter? <laughs> like, it wasn't the, it was laughter, people associate laughter with being like, oh, you had a good time. Laughter doesn't always mean you had a good time. 
laughter, sometimes you're like, oh shit, that's so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I can't believe you just, <laughs> or it can mean like, <laughs> but people have like, you guys, I mean, Michelle Martin on NPR, they was like, you are laughing. What's, like, I think, again, it's like associating humor with a lesser thing, when really it's like, laughter was moving the conversation along. So, the other thing I'll say is that, Absolutely the feedback I got from the Klan episode and the Richard Spencer episode, and also the feedback from America in general about where we are, is why this season I was like, no more obvious enemies. We have no Richard Spencer-y type Klan interviews, because I was like, first of all, I don't want people to think that's all we do. Like, you know, the Klan episode aired like three, two years ago, but I still hear about it. I don't want people to think every season, I'm like, who's the, who's the enemy? So for me this season, we did an episode about the sick community that was overwhelmingly positive. It had bits where it was like tense and there was, there was a lot of, it had all the feels in it, but we didn't go, let's talk to somebody who hates the six. You know, so for me, this season was really me sort of going, I don't want to do that because I don't want people to think that that's what I'm out there doing, so. What is, if you could have like one main takeaway that people would have from your show, what do you want them to think you're doing? Uh, Sesame Street for grownups. <laughs> Like when, I, when we did the sick episode and we just did the Geechee Gullah episode this past Sunday, people were like, I learned so much, but they're not saying it like it was bad. They're like, it was fun to learn. And for me, it's like, it was fun for me to be there. So if I can translate the fun I'm having there, sometimes I'm doing it through humor and sometimes it's just through human connection, sometimes it's through tears. So for me, this season, I've heard a lot about how much people are learning from the show. And, I, and for me, that's the, that's the thing that it's like, we're, it's the way Sesame Street was. It was like the learning is sort of mixed in with something where you're like, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You know, I still remember that from Sesame Street, you know? But, and so every time, you know, so for me, it's like, if that's what the show is, it's just a way to sort of like share information that I've acquired and that I hope that, and I know if I don't know it, somebody out there else, some other people out there don't know it. And seeing it in such a specific environment, I know what that audience knows is pretty limited. So for me, it's like, if I'm on, I'm trying to think, if I, was doing a, if I was doing a show in Pakistan and I do an episode about the, about the Sikh religion, it's going to be a different episode because it's like, because I'm talking to people like, yeah, we know. So then I have to sort of frame it in a different way. But, if, but on CNN, it's framed as like a very sort of like, let's just open, let's just do, make, if we can get you to do this every week, you know, I feel good. Well, I know something that I have been excited to ask you would probably be, could you compare, or what's your take on the comparison of the discourse that's happened with Childish Gambino's? I, I knew it was going to be a Childish Gambino question. <laughs> I, just was like, I think it's going to be this, this is America. <laughs> tweet, hashtag if slavery was, it, could you talk about how do you pick and choose how to comment and respond to that? I mean, the, the Kanye moment, this happens to black people like once every few weeks. <laughs> where there's a black thing that happens, and then everywhere you go, you have to have the conversation about it. It's a good conversation, though. No, but I'm saying, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's somebody on the news who's like, ain't nobody got time for that, and you gotta have that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like something where you're like, I don't even care. Like, you have to go watch the clip so you can have the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, the Kanye conversation to me was like, like it, and it just had come after Starbucks week, too, so it was like, oh. It was like two black things, black to black. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm still having, we st I just said, can I have a week off? Uh, I mean, the Kanye conversation wrapped itself up quite nicely because the dude was like, Van Lathan was right there in the room and sort of was like, hold on, before you leave, let me just... So for me, it was its own complete piece. You know what I mean? It was its own, like, I don't, it felt like, is this fake? Because this feels too good. Uh, so Kanye says slavery is not a, slavery is a choice and all the other things he said. And then right there in the TMZ room, a black guy goes, I got to tap in. And he <laughs> explains to Kanye why that doesn't make any sense. And for me, it just felt like I was just sort of like, highlighting and excited about what Van had done and that it sort of wrapped up the conversation in a way that like by the time Kanye left the room he was like I probably screwed that up. <laughs> uh, now that to hug it out after yeah he went yeah he, and Van was like nope I'm good uh, uh, yeah so he and then he sent out a tweet like about slavery's not exactly a choice maybe choices yeah it's like yeah shut up uh, so that's so that's you know he has freedom of speech he didn't have the freedom from the consequences of a black dude going come here for a second I need to talk to you uh, so, and then when I'm, we're all sort of like in the Kanye thing, like, oh God, but how did, how good is this album going to have to be for us to forget all this? Uh, Donald Glover goes, just, just check this out. Uh, right. <laughs> and for me, it was just like, Donald, this is America is, is like, 
I like tweeted out that night, like, this is going to be taught in black history classes next week. You know, like, it's just such a, like, way in which pop culture can sort of, like, spark a, spark a conversation in a way that nothing else in culture can. Ta-Nehisi Coates can write as many blog articles as he wants to, but until he actually writes the Black Panther, it's sort of like, oh, now I'm starting to, you know, so, like, the Black Panther comic book, not the movie. But uh, that, the Donald Glover thing was just such a, like, it, like, you know he didn't make it in contrast to Kanye, it's just sometimes things work perfectly. So, for me, I love, like, I, I just watched The Childish Gambino you know, thing today because it's like this thing where I'm like, let me just see it one more time. Like, it's, I'm, I think we're still early into what does this mean because his album hasn't even come out yet, you know what I'm saying? But I think it's absolutely, like, that's the kind of art that really gets me excited because it's like he's provo he, it's very purposeful, it's very artful in that it was like, he's not just sort of, like, serving it, giving us medicine, mm -hmm. and it's also sticky, so you keep wanting to go back to it, which is the best kind of, it's political, it's artful, and it's sticky, like you keep wanting to go back to it. And I also knew as soon as it happened, like, oh no, there's going to be a lot of people doing parody videos of this. And then, like two days ago, yep. Nicole Arbor uh, releases This is a White Woman, uh, Blonde, and when I say pretty, I mean the way that America calls white women pretty. I don't mean that's my, I'm just saying pretty, like Britney Spears-esque or whatever you want to call it. And she releases This is America and she put, calls it the woman edit. Oh, yeah, or like the, the, the woman she edit. The, 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 she calls it says it's the woman edit, which is like acting as if Donald Glover hadn't included women's, I, like black women aren't women, you know what I mean? Like there's black women in the Donald Glover video. And it's, and to me, it's so show us the power of the Donald Glover video and how quickly people were like, this is not, you, this, you don't understand any of this, you know? So I, I, I really enjoyed that. I enjoy when the conversation happens like that, when it's like, you can see how powerful the Donald Glover thing is when people are so how quick to reject this other version, which is just not, it's just not good. I encourage every, every white person, especially white woman, you have to go watch it because you should have to defend this the way we had to defend Kanye. So every white person, and especially white woman, needs to go watch Nicole Arbor's This Is America, because you need to be as conversant in that as we are in Kanye and Starbucks. Yeah. Great. If I could say, um, it's 3 o'clock now, so if we could switch now to audience questions. And, um, and also, <coughs> if you have questions or comments to direct uh, to Mr. Bell and the panel, so we can continue the conversation without a microphone. That was so quick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe it wasn't. <coughs> Just wondering if you have any comments on the uh, Michelle Wolf <laughs> speech at the sure. correspondence dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching. I was like, I don't have the courage she has to to stand in a room and do that. Like, I just would like. I feel like I would be like, <laughs> sorry guys. Uh, I feel like I would skip jokes. Like, don't do that one. Uh, it's not about me agreeing with every one of the jokes. Political perspective, as I said earlier, it's not about that. It's about she played that exactly as she was supposed to. You know, there's a phrase a, a, a phrase that I've heard recently. I heard before, but it means more to me now. And I heard it before this. And I, you know, it's like you're supposed to. Uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, you know, as an artist and, or any art, but any, there's lots of jobs where I can do. And I feel like as an, as a comedian, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I want my jokes to do. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That room of reporters is a room full of comfortable people. There is no reason for her to go up there and kiss their butts. There's no percentage in that. It doesn't, why would they do that? They're just journalists. The profession isn't noble. The person in the profession is who makes it noble. So, uh, I, so for me, when I saw how it was going down, I was really like, oh man, she's not playing the room, she's playing the people at home, which is who she should be playing. That room is not gonna make, is not gonna give her a career. There's not enough people in that room to give her a career. It's the people at home watching on the internet who are gonna give her a career. So she was like actually panning for her audience and not actually, didn't care about what the people in the room said. And also, she, those people need to be uncomfortable, and those people need to question themselves. And those people need to wonder if they're, because they're sort of there to be like, we're the coolest, we're the greatest people ever. Like, it's called nerd prom. Why do you need to have a prom? Like, why do we need to, why do you need to be celebrated in front of, why, you can do that, but why do we need to watch you do that? Was anybody else's prom live streaming on the internet? Like, why do we all need to sit around you and, good job, journalists. Like, so, I think that she did the exact right thing. She's probably ended comedians at the White House Press Correspondents' Dinner, which is great, because that means I don't have to be afraid of them offering me that job. I would never take it. Uh, so yeah, I was super. And, and also, the other thing, I thought the, the people in the press who accused her 
of making fun of Sarah Huckabee's looks revealed themselves to be more interested because she didn't. I had to like watch it again because I was like, oh, did she? And I, she didn't. I had, are, more, are revealing themselves to be more interested in incurring favor with the Trump administration, who they pretend they disagree with, than actually def afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. Um, I'm wondering, how do we deal with situations like what happened in Berkeley, for example, where we had the free speech week, um, and in order to have the speakers, Berkeley had to spend so much money in order to guarantee the security of the speakers and the people attending the event. How do we deal with situations like that, where people are getting just so angry, where they can't even let others speak at an event? Like, I mean, I think that a lot of these speakers have, a, a lot of the people who, who sort of want to be on these free speak things, I'm thinking of like Milo and... Ann Coulter. Ann Coulter has gone to college campuses for years and spoke. I've been at college campuses where she was, she was just here last week. I'm like, why would you book me? That? You know, whatever. <laughs> or maybe that's why you booked me. So Ann Coulter has traveled around, has spent her life traveling around college campuses of all types, giving her, sp but she became interested in the, being a part of the story. And those people like Milo, Milo wants to create a situation. It doesn't, doesn't help Milo to go give a speech at a college campus and leave. Like he needs the story. He needs to trend on Twitter. Uh, I actually was booked at, uh, I can't remember the college, but I was booked, I was the, like, because they didn't, uh, there was a college who, who the, like, the Republican, I don't know who it is, but say he, had, like, an, a club had booked him into a room on campus where Miley was going to speak, and so they booked him. The college was worried about what was going to happen, so I got booked as part of a counter-programming thing, so, like, so that people don't go protest him, they will come and watch you. <laughs> So I went, and there's like tanks, because they're worried about what's going to happen. And I was like, OK, I will do this, but do, I, do not try to create a situation where me and Milo have to be in the same room or where we cross paths. I was like, I'll do it, but I'm not in any way engaging in this for sort of fun. I, don't, I do this for a living. I have a family. This is not a game. So uh, I'm not trying to be, I don't, care, I don't need the clicks that Milo needs. So I did it. It was a great show. I left immediately, because I didn't want to be on the campus afterwards. Uh, but and the, apparently nothing went down. So for me, it's like, I get where college campuses are struggling because some of these people are coming to create a situation and then blame the university for a situation happening. They're not actually doing this in good faith. Conservatives travel around the country all the time speaking on all sorts of college campuses. And if you just come to speak, it's fine. If you come to create a situation or your, again, consequences from the free speech. If your free speech generally encourages riots, then the college has the right to go, I don't know if we want to have a riot this weekend. We've also got a football game. I mean, you guys don't. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so I just feel like the universities are specifically set up to be safe spaces. They were, they were built by people to give students a place to go, to, to give people at that point between full on adulthood and, and, and childhood a place to nurture and grow. This is, it's automatically a safe space. So therefore, it has to create a feeling of safety. And if it doesn't create a feeling of safety, then they have to figure something out about it. So yeah, I, I, I think, like Ben Shapiro is one of the, also one of the guys who travels. And he's in this weird position of like enjoying the clicks, but also just wanting to give the speech. And I feel like you got to go on one side or the other, dude. You can't curry the clicks and also to give the speech. You have to pick a side. So I feel like those of you who agree with Ben Shapiro or Milo or Ann Coulter, see what they actually want to accomplish. See what they actually want to show up and do. Is it to give a speech and so that people can listen to what they think, or are they actually chasing the story? I perform at colleges I've, all over the country. Trinity University in San Antonio, Appalachian State, uh, Auburn and I went to I played Auburn University in, in Auburn, Alabama, like either weeks before or after Richard Spencer. Mine did not make national news. Why? Because I just went and did my thing and went home, you know. But Richard Spencer is trying to create a, a create an, create a happening. Um, first off, thank you for coming to speak today. Um, my question for you is: You do a lot of um, interviews with very incendiary people, so people who are on the extreme viewpoint, um, and sometimes they say things, of course, that are. Um, an attack on your identity or things that you are morally opposed to. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you handle those types of situations without getting upset? How do you kind of deflect those statements and bring it back to have a meaningful conversation? Because I know a lot of times people have conversations and when their identity is attacked, it's very hard to move on. Um, it's very affecting. It's something that is hard to deflect. So what are your recommendations on that? 
I mean, let's be clear. The things that people get away with saying to me on TV, they wouldn't get away with saying to me in life if I was walking down the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, we are creating a very specific, and I don't mean that in a threatening way. I just mean like, I'd be like, what? Uh, I'm leaving. You know what I mean? Like, it would just, I just wouldn't stand, I wouldn't sit for the same thing. On TV, I'm actually creating an environment through which I'm here to let you talk. And so if you say something that is, incent that is if I feel like you're trying to troll me, I know, I, I'll go, oh, you're trying to troll me. I don't, it's not like I'm like, oh, you don't actually have power over me. You also don't have power over the edits. You can say whatever you want to say. I get to edit it. <laughs> so I just feel there's no, the power dynamic is in my favor in those situations. And also I know if I get angry at something you say, then you have the power. And I mean, this is something I do in life. Like I do take in life. Like if, unless this person really has power over you, what does it matter what they think of you if, unless they're like your boss or your teacher or your lover or, you know, or your roommate? That's when it becomes like, okay, we got to figure this out. But if it's just a random person in the world, if it feels physically threatening, that's another issue. But if it's just them saying words, I feel, again, there's a comic. I've been in a lot of situations where people said a lot of heinous things to me, you know, because that's how comedy works in the beginning. So I really just don't put stock in it. There's very few people, there's a handful of people in my life who can say things to me where if they say it and it, it hurts, and it will hurt my feelings in a way that I feel like this actually guts me. Those people are legally connected to me or they've been my friends since high school. Like, you know, like it's, not, it's not like just random people walking down the street. And I find the more you can sort of slough off words, the, the more those people then don't know what to say next. The more you can say like, oh, because if you know somebody is homophobic and then they say homophobic things, it's just like, oh, I knew that. And you know what I mean? It can be like, oh, this, this guy, this is the homophobic guy. Yeah, he says things. <laughs> If you're gay and your mom says it, well, that means something different. You know what I mean? But I, so I feel for me, it's like if it's not physically threatening, if I feel safe in the environment, if I'm also doing it for a different purpose, like I'm doing it for television or I'm on stage with people, it just doesn't have the same power over me. And also, that's why humor works, because if you can then make fun of the thing they said when they said it, and then they feel like, oh, yay. So I feel like that's, that's where being a comedian helps, because it's like I just, I'm not taking this that seriously. If you're not going to take me seriously, then I'm not taking you seriously at all. Thank you for that answer. Um, so your philosophy is around like you, um, you're fine with freedom of, of speech, but people don't necessarily have the freedom of consequence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I definitely understand that like on a large scale where people might have to um, apologize or take a financial hit if there's wealth. But what about more of like the smaller scale things that maybe happen on campus where those consequences of like financial stuff or saying a public apology isn't going to really matter because they're, it's just another student, which can for, I mean, kind of what you were just saying, like it's just another student kind of let it roll off the backs of someone's being impacted possibly. Yeah. But like, I don't, I don't know, does my question? No, I mean, I, I, you can't edit all the enemies out of your life. You know what I mean? You have to, there's certain, a certain percentage of ignorance that you're going to have to deal with. And as much as somebody may say something that, that offends you, which is entire, I never, everybody has every right to be offended about everything they want to be offended by. So it's not about like me saying you shouldn't be offended by that. But it's like, you also have to sort of understand at some point, you just have to deal with a certain, there's a certain level of just nonsense and things you have to deal with. And you have to figure out how to, if you're a healthy person, how to like not let it all get to inside to your brain. You know what I mean? How to not let it all sort of seep in. I, it's, for me, it's like, it's very clear now, like, it's sort of back to what this person asked me over here. Like, when people will be like, will say these, like, sort of things that they're really trying to hurt my feelings, or they're really trying to tell me that I'm wrong, or they're really trying to say something, and where they're not trying to be constructive, and I've just, since I've had kids, I'm like, I had too much going on to deal with you. You know, like, I, are you going to help me raise my kids? No, then I'll have to deal with this. <laughs> Like I really just, and this is age is a lot of this at some point. I mean, it feels like that. I'm really grateful for that because it's just like, I just don't feel like I got to take this in. So I think sometimes on college campus, there is a sense of like wanting to resolve an issue. But at some point you have to realize you can't resolve all the issues. You have to pick and choose when is it time to stand up and take a stand. If, you stand, if you're standing up all the time, you're not going to have the energy to stand. And I feel like it, but if you sort of like, it's like, the, it's like the Oakland barbecue thing. Those people are like, today, we're doing it. And I feel like they all decided independently to have the energy to stand up. But, but certainly there's many, and people of color, I'm sure every person of color in this room can say that, every woman can say that. Every day there's things happening. There's, you know, and if you, and if you went home and ca if you cataloged them, you'd be like, Jesus, that was a lot. But if you actually, some of you have to let go because it's like, you know what, I gotta get to class. 
you know. But I do think there is a power to holding on to those things to figure out. If I can't figure it out, figure it out now, I'm going to figure out something later with it. You know what I'm saying? Like I think that there's there's a power to sort of like not holding on to it in here, but just like okay, let me put that on the shelf, and we're going to get back to that when I have more time. And I think that's what I've seen a lot of people, and that great art can come out of that. It's clear, like when I saw, I was talking to, my, to Kelly, who I work with, we watched the Donald Glover video, This Is America, again this morning, and I was like, man, he's not on Twitter. I need to get off Twitter. Like, it just felt like This Is America is for a dude who's not dealing with all this, every conversation all the time. He's like putting it on a shelf. He's not responding on everything. And he's sort of like, then he goes, let's take down Oh, look at this video. I'm not saying I can create something as great as This is America, but I did sort of feel like this dude is picking his spots. Yeah. So yeah, I think you have, there's a certain lot of bullshit you have to deal with, but you shouldn't have to, but pick and choose your spots. And also know you can't resolve everything. Well, I started with one question, but the longer you talk, the more questions I have. I'll <laughs> narrow it down to one. Um, which is that, uh, so for the past year, I've been part of the man, the administration, as my friends call it. And so when I hear... Your friends call it the administration, or, and you call it the man? Which way is it? No, no, my friends say, uh, oh, you're the man. Now. Okay. <laughs> right. um, so as you might have heard, incidents happen. And I, I think, I agree with people who think it is imperative to make some kind of... Um, it's more than bystander intervention. It's acknowledging that there is harm, and it's mm -hmm. not saying, ah, just let it roll off you. So I'm wondering if you have your own sense of um, modulated outrage, like you, you, it, with the um, Aussies or whatever that play. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the Elmwood Cafe. Right. I mean, yes. you're in a different. That's a different you. Yeah, that was the and time where my family chose school, to like. That's a different you. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, can you comment at all on on what? A university's responsibility should be to call out ignorance I mean, and what is the mission of the school? I mean, it comes down to that. Like, if we're at Oral Roberts University, that's a very particular mission. Mm -hmm. If we're at, uh, like, you know, Smith College, which I'm just saying that because my goddaughter just got into Smith, that's a specific. What is the mission of the of the school? What is the school here for? Who is the school here for? Who does the school want here who's not currently coming here? And how does the school create the environment through which those people show up? Who, who is the school safe for who's on campus now? And I feel like those questions have to be asked regularly because who shows up in the school is always going to be different. And also, if you're not getting the people you want, or the people you want show up here and then within a year, like, I got to go back home or I got to transfer to a better school like Stanford, then <laughs> 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 that's where I lose you. Uh, whatever, whatever it is, I just said that to be shitty. Uh, but that to me like it's very if i you know it's very clear I, I think sometimes when schools try to be agnostic about hate i'm just like what who does that benefit what is the mission of the school well so, sometimes there's a riot you know i mean you know it's a, we can't really get, i think it's really a cowardly position when you have a specific institution that was set up for specific values to not get involved in the things that happen on that campus if you want to celebrate when the basketball teams wins, you got to deal with when the alt right shows up. Like so, for me, it's like I think that it's a I think it's just institutionally, and I'm not saying anything specific here, but you can't be agnostic when you have invited people to come here to pay a lot of money and you put the mission on the college campus things and say we're here for everybody. Then you got to you got to create an environment that is that is equitable for everybody. And if you don't, then you're going to look up. I mean, you know. I mean, honestly, like my wife graduated from here, so I, I'd been coming here for years. Walking around and seeing the school and how the school is set up now, there's a lot of good resources here. There's a lot of good, I've met a lot of good people here. There's not a lot of people of color here. So when my daughters grow up and become 18, they're like, Dad, I'd be like, well, you can go look, but why don't we go to Spelman? You know what I mean? Like, I'm excited about the idea of Spelman. They may not be, but I'm like, because you don't know what, because I've seen a lot of these things. So I feel like, now that's my thing. You know, that's, I feel like the, and, and when I hear people talk about race on this campus, I get like, oh, there's some shit happening here. You know what I mean? So for me, it's like, if I can reflect anything from what I've seen in the school and the time I've been here, is that there's a lot of unhad, there's a lot of behind doors conversations that need to be brought into the open, and the school has to have a stake in figuring it out. Not hoping that the students do, but the school has to have a stake in figuring it out. 
So earlier you said that you didn't think that Richard Spencer or the Klan were the most extreme positions that, that you've encountered. What are the most extremes? You know, uh, I have way more fear of a police officer I don't know than I have of Richard Spencer or the Klan. It's very unlikely that I'm going to run into Richard Spencer after this, after we leave here. It's very unlikely I'm going to run into a Klan's member between here and Berkeley where I live. But I'm going to come across a police, it's very likely I can come across a police officer and shit can go sideways real quick. So I don't have, so for me it's like when people talk about, I was way more nervous about the episode we did with the Camden Police Department than I was about the Klan episode. I got more pushback about the Camden, about the, about the Klan episode, but for me I'm like, as a black man on TV, we just did an episode about Border Patrol, and I was like, God damn it, I hate being on TV with the police. Because it feel, that feels like, I don't want to normalize the police. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's more dangerous to me. The, the Klan can't be normalized. I feel like they've already turned themselves into cartoon characters. It's easy to put a good cop, a cop who like, says all the right things, and have people go, oh, maybe the cops aren't a troubled organization that needs some attention. But, you know, maybe black people are, are exaggerating, because this black guy's sitting next to a cop. So for me, I'm way more worried about the people who are, the, the, the Congress, the Senate, the President, and what they're doing every day that I think is anti-humanity in a lot of ways, than I'm worried about the Klan and Richard Spencer. But ideologically, do you think that there are positions that are further right than Richard Spencer? The I mean, right and left is sort of a, I don't know that that category really exists in the same way, but yes, there are people, there are Klan's members who wouldn't even talk to me. You know, we talked to, they, they reached out to a hundred different groups, four said they would talk to us. That means there was 96 groups who were like, I don't even want to be in the same space as a black dude. You know what I mean? So uh, there is, there is like, we, I mean, you can go Google, there's neo-Nazi shit that makes Richard Spencer look vanilla and who call Richard Spencer vanilla? They, that he's not, that's really like, he actually wants to put people on buses and send them back to Mexico. You know, there's people calling for like, what, will a race riot, will a race war happen? I don't think so, but there's people calling for that. There's people who are actively calling for blood in the streets. There's people, you know, there's all these, there's all these militia groups that you can find online who are like buying the guns prepared for the, thing, for the end of days. That is way more extreme than a bunch of clams and burning the cross in the, in the forest. You know, do I, that, and that's why I don't necessarily want to talk to those people. So there's, there's a lot of people I won't talk to because it's like, but, and like I said, this season we decided not to talk to any of those people. Um, so what do you think about the White House AIDS joke about John McCain dying and the whole reaction to that? I think if we think that those jokes don't happen all the time, we're fooling ourselves, that jokes like that, like those are really dark places. I think, you know, there's a gallows humor that develops from like doc emergency room doctors, military people. So people who are even on the right side, who are on the side of the angels in those situations have to use humor to cope. So I think that, but not to say that this person was or that that joke was, but I'm saying that like, we can't act like that's the only time that's happened. What's interesting is, so now, but now we live in an era where those things leak out regularly. The joke isn't the issue, it's the, it's the White House's response to the joke, or non-response. Like, the fact is, probably not a good look to make a joke about, jo about any person who's suffering from, like, a, an intense illness, and especially somebody like John McCain, who's considered a war hero, and especially who's in your party. Like, there's, like, all these things where it's like, so why haven't they fired that person? Why haven't they come out with a strong statement against that person? Why are they sort of, like, they're just letting it roll. That's the interesting part, that they don't really have the integrity to call that person out. You know, she, whoever she is, she's not like the most key official in the White House. They can let her go and replace her, you know. Uh, you know, it's not a, it's, you know, so it's not even, so I feel like that, that's what I think is interesting is that their lack of response reveals who they are. As, is it Maya Angelou, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time? <laughs> They've shown us who they are several times, <laughs> you know, so we, but this is who they are. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um. I was wondering how we go about breaking out of our bubble um, in the way like Facebook we kind of have our friends who all spout the same opinion as us. Um, even your show on CNN, the people who need to have the conversation or the people we need to have the conversation with like the KKK or Richard Spencer supporters are not the ones watching CNN. So how do you reach out and have these difficult conversations when we're so insulated with just people who share our own opinions, and how do you find them? I mean, I would, I would uh, to play devil's advocate, uh, <laughs> I don't, I think, again, I think CNN's audience is like 60-year-old white people. Those are actually the people who need to have the conversation. 
Those are the people who are like, what is a sick or a Sikh? What, those are the people who are like, we need to build the wall. They're not the Fox News people, but it's still the same audience. You know what I'm saying? So I think in that sense, like, again, if the if if, if United States of America was on Follow Democracy Now, like, it would be a different show, you know, because I would be playing for a different demographic. But for the CNN audience, I am actually playing for the least woke people possible. Uh, maybe Fox News is different. But I, so I think that I, I'm very aware of the fact that people are like, I had never heard of the Geechee Gullah people of South Carolina. Like, so the, I'd never, I didn't, I didn't know anything about six. I didn't know, these are people who are like walking around just going like, I, whatever I read on my Facebook, I'm taking them out of their Facebook feed. And then I'm hoping they go back into their Facebook feed with this knowledge. But the thing to do if, outside of that is to actively burst out of the bubble. Like you're in a room full of people who showed up to this event. Uh, you probably don't know everybody in this room, uh, but everybody in this room is somebody who's interested in this conversation. So then find somebody in this room or find several people in this room and go, hey, let's talk about what we saw there and let's talk about all I didn't like what he said because I didn't like that guy. Whatever, like whatever it is, you, you, take opportunity. This is a space where like you actually can reach out to a stranger because we sort of created this circumstance. But what happens in these situations, and I say this kind of thing all the time, you're, all of you right now are going, yeah, I, mean, I should do that. When it's over, let me get the hell out of here. You know what I mean? So like take advantage of times like in college you're in a petri dish for this and what you learn here if you learn how to break out of the bubbles here it will be easier later in life when you don't have time to figure out how to do it so for me it's like right now we've created the perfect environment for you to walk up to anybody in this room and go come out told me to do this are you interested in having a conversation now or tomorrow or we and they will go yes or no and if then then take it from there so i think but that you have to take your opportunities as uh shoot your shot as they say this is the, you know this we, this is a perfect opportunity On that note, and um, touching on something that somebody said earlier about having those difficult conversations when you very clearly disagree with the person you're talking to, mm -hmm. but tailoring it this time to those that you're legally bound to or to those that have been in your life for years, um, how do you keep your cool or do you have any advice as to how to keep your cool when you hear these comments and that personally offend you? How do you keep the door open to conversation? Because I'm at the point where I've taken politics completely off the table. Um, and I don't think that's productive with people that are close to me in my True. life. No, I, I, I want to just, yes, no, you're right I about that. I think that's a good relationship to have with these people mm -hmm. that I love, truly. Um, so what advice do you have to offer? I mean, I'm about to spout a bunch of like cliches and aphorisms. It's a sprint, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Two step forward, one step back. I think there's a lot of like, there's times when, I don't know who your person is, but there's times when you're like, you, you, gift, you gift people with your presence, especially family. It's Thanksgiving. We will see, and you sort of, sometimes you go, I have to go to Thanksgiving even though I don't want to talk to my mom, for example. Well, some, if you've had a series of bad interactions with your mom in a row, sometimes the way you handle it is go, you know what? I'm not going to go to Thanksgiving this year. That doesn't mean you're never not going to go back again. It just means this year I'm going to, and your mom's going to be like, but why not? Well, mom, I just, it's hard because we always fight or we always do that and I just don't want to do it. I don't want to go hang out with my friends. But I have to, uh, you have to alter the way in which you're having the conversation. That's your mom, everybody's mom. But I don't know. <laughs> so in, our, in me and my wife's life, we had situations with certain members of her family, not her parents, nobody you know, uh, where we just, I, I just, we had to sort of go, we're not going to do that the same way anymore. And then what happens is over time, you either find a way to go back where you've created a new boundary or that person goes, reaches out to you, which is what happened in Melissa's family, he goes, what, how do we fix this? So I think you can't always bang your head against the same wall over and over again. Sometimes you go, you know what, I'm just not gonna come to this wall anymore. Uh, so I feel like you have to be able to change strategies and also give yourself a break. And also if that person stop, you don't always have to stay in the room. When that person goes, I don't like your lifestyle or I don't like the thing you said, sometimes you're like, I'm gonna go take a walk. Like you can actually like choose how you engage in the car, and, the, and in those moments, the other person has to then figure out why did they just leave? Why why did she take a walk? Why did she why is she taking a walk every 15 minutes? <laughs> Maybe we need to figure out how to have this conversation. And I think <laughs> that if the person realizes that what they're doing is not promoting a relationship with you that you want, because sometimes there are parents who just want you at Thanksgiving, they don't care if you're happy or not. So you go, okay, you know what? So it doesn't matter. If <laughs> <laughs> I just heard like a. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They don't care if you're not happy. They're just like, you're here, so I won. 
So then you stop going to Thanksgiving. I mean, I, with my dad, I can talk about my dad. There was a, like, a, I don't know how long, but it was this couple of years where I was like, he lives in Mobile, Alabama. He wants me there, this is before I got married, every Thanksgiving and Christmas, every Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I was like, you know what? I told myself one year, I'm not going this year. And it was hard, because he's like, why aren't you going? And I didn't have a real reason. Because it's like, I could, there's no event I can create that he's going to go, well, that makes sense, you know. It's like, cause, you know, it's like, he's like, cause I just don't want to, I, I don't want to come. And that's a hard conversation, but it was a better Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I thought for a second, I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to go back again. Well, guess what? Now I go back, we talk about, we talk, I, I convince him why capitalism is wrong and why uh, we talk, we talked about why Walmart should pay more for its employees to work and how that puts them on food stamps. And he was like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, that's not a conversation with my dad. My dad's basically a Republican. But he's black, so he can't say it out loud. Uh, <laughs> but so it's like taking time off from my dad made our relationship better. It didn't make it better in the short term, but it definitely made it better in the long term. So I just remember your presence is a gift. Don't gi don't, and don't give that gift away. I regret to say it's all the time we have today. So please join me in thanking Kamal Bell, Taylor Berry, Marioso, Sarah Carter, and Anand Perho. Thank you so much. This has been videotaped. If you'd like to uh, sort of review it or share things with friends, and uh, the video will be posted, I think, on the dean's web office website and on the ethics center website as well. I, I, I like, Eddie, I Thank you for coming. Wish me a time.